Good day or evening, wherever you may be. I'm Glenn Tiffert, Research Fellow and Manager of the Hoover Institution's Project on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific Region. On behalf of the Hoover Institution, I'd like to welcome you to the fifth session of our annual conference on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific Region, which is devoted to the theme of democracy, good governance, and pluralism. In a region and world where democracy, good governance, and pluralism are, under, are experiencing intensifying pressure, Taiwan has been an inspiring bright spot. From its economic miracle and peaceful transition over the past several decades from one party authoritarian rule to vibrant multi-party democracy to the extraordinary effectiveness of its responses to the COVID-19 pandemic and to the scourge of online disinformation during its presidential campaign and elections earlier this year, Taiwan has set the bar high. Today, we explore some of the micro and macro level conditions of that success. We have an outstanding lineup of participants in store for you. So let me start by introducing the, the chair of today's panel, Dr. Lanny Chen. Lanny Chen is a Hoover Research Fellow and Director of US Domestic Policy Studies in the Public Policy Program at Stanford University. He served as a senior official in the US Department of Health and Human Services during the administration of George W. Bush and has advised several US presidential campaigns. A prominent observer and analyst of Taiwan affairs, he is a frequent media commentator and cherished contributor to this project. Lanny, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn, and thank you to uh, everyone who's joining us today, but in particular to uh, the distinguished panel that we've put together to discuss uh, issues of democracy, good governance, and pluralism. Uh, let me introduce first the panelists and then our discussant for this uh, afternoon or evening. And then I'll say a brief bit about uh, the papers and the issues we'll be discussing today. Our first panelist, Dr. Lavina Lee, is senior lecturer in the Department of Modern History, Politics, and International Relations at Macquarie University. She's the author of U.S. Hegemony and International Legitimacy, Norms, Power, and Followership in the Wars on Iraq. Second is Dr. Chin So Wang, who is professor of political science at National Chengkung University. His research focuses on judicial politics. And finally, Dr. Karis Templeman is a visiting scholar at the Hoover Institution. Formerly, he led the Taiwan Democracy and Security Project in the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center, or APARC, at Stanford. He's co-editor of Dynamics of Democracy in Taiwan, the Mayan Zhou Years. And our discussant, of course, is a familiar face to all, Dr. Larry Diamond, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, who chairs Hoover's projects on Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific region and China's global sharp power. A renowned expert on democracy, he's the author of Ill Winds, Saving Democracy from Russian Rage, Chinese Ambition, and American Complacency. Today, we'll be hearing from uh, our three panelists, as I noted earlier. Uh, we'll hear first from Dr. Lee, who has written a paper on how the PRC's Belt and Road Initiative undermines liberal democratic governance and why those who seek to support democracy should directly counter the BRI. Her focus is on the US's program recently announced by Vice President Mike Pence, the Indo-Pacific Transparency Initiative or IPTI. She argues that the IPTI is key to countering the PRC's quote, soothing and seductive messages that is a very apt way of describing what Beijing is doing, these soothing and seductive messages behind the BRI, uh, and moreover, the fact that these messages have a willing and receptive audience, uh, not only to the messages themselves, but to the values and perhaps more importantly, the material offerings behind the Belt and Road Initiative. She argues that the promotion of civil society, rule of law, transparent and accountable government, offers an important counter to both the geostrategic as well as normative challenges posed by the Belt and Road Initiative. Secondly, we'll hear from Dr. Wang, who argues about the role of coercive activity and the, the link between the coercive activity, the judiciary, and the former ruling party, the Kuomintang in Taiwan. Uh, he looks at how the decrease of coercion diminishes or has diminished the ability of the KMT to control and protect its brokers or local politicians. She ar he argues that democratization has decreased the role of coercion in Taiwanese politics, and in particular looks at the judiciary and the impact of the judiciary on Taiwanese democratic politics and the breakdown of KMT clientelism and broadly the KMT's impact on Taiwanese politics. 
And finally, Dr. Templeman will give us uh, remarks from a paper entitled Countering Sharp Power Lessons from Taiwan, where he discusses the resilience of Taiwan's democracy in the face of an aggressive PRC sharp power campaign designed to make Taiwan's political climate friendlier to the PRC's view of unification. He in particular discusses the resilience of Taiwan's democratic institutions, regulatory bodies with broad powers, independent and energetic prosecutor's offices, and an excellent system of campaign management. As someone who had the opportunity to witness Taiwan's presidential elections in January firsthand, I will say that Dr. Templeman's assessment of the Taiwanese system of campaign management, system of, of electoral uh, uh, balloting and, and counting is uh, truly one of the examples for the world in terms of ways of ensuring a transparent and fully democratic process. So with that introduction, I look forward to this broad and wide ranging conversation we'll have today on the topics of democracy, good governance and pluralism. With that, Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I want to first start by thanking Larry Diamond and Glenn Tiffert for inviting me to speak here today. It's a great pleasure to be here. Now, I wanted to speak to you about the BRI and the broader threat to democracy that it poses. The United States and other liberal democracies in the region oppose the Belt and Road Initiative on the basis that it is a, a grand blueprint to advance and entrench a dominant economic role for China within a vast region that stretches from East Asia to Europe and from the Middle East to Africa. The BRI is also frequently criticized as a blueprint to advance authoritarianism in these regions. However, it's not always clearly explained how the BRI seeks to do that. More explicit arguments are needed if the BRI is to be treated as both a material and a normative challenge to the US and the liberal rules-based order. In the brief time that I have, I wanna offer three arguments and some empirical observations explaining how the BRI undermines liberal dem democratic governance and why democracy promotion ought to include efforts to counter key aspects of the BRI. First, the BRI is the main vehicle by which Beijing propels a grand narrative of sinocentric success, opportunity and guaranteed gains emanating from Chinese authoritarian capitalism. In many countries where political systems are assessed on their short-term economic and developmental outcomes, rather than commitment to principles, the spread of autocratic values is achieved by the seemingly rapid economic outcomes the BRI can produce. China no longer shies away from proclaiming that it has perfected an alternative form of capitalism that is worthy of emulation because it can create economic prosperity without the supposed irrational and inefficient decision-making processes involved with liberal democracy. In his speech to the 19th Congress of the CCP in October 2017, for example, President Xi asserted that China's political model was, I quote, blazing a new trail for other developing countries to achieve modernization and which offered a new option for other countries and nations who wanted to speed up their development while preserving their independence. Further, the Xinhua News Agency openly derided liberal democracy as a system marked by, I quote, endless political backbiting, bickering and policy reversals, which have retarded economic and social progress and ignored the interests of most citizens. The economic success of the China model, together with positive perceptions that such a system allows elites to govern efficiently and effectively, provide the building blocks for the promotion and spread of authoritarian values. The BRI takes this narrative one step further by demonstrating the success of the China model to the world and offering others a share of that success. As Xi has put it to Southeast Asian nations, when the big river is full of water, 
the small ones never run dry. It is important to note the absorption of these grand narratives and diffusion of, of authoritarian values finds a receptive audience among the populations of the many developing countries in the Indo-Pacific, in which a, a relatively shallow commitment to democracy and an openness to centralised rule has been observed. For example, a 2017 Pew Research Centre survey found that only 15% or less of those surveyed from the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam and India were committed Democrats, meaning that they rejected alternatives to representative democracy outright. These results are not necessarily surprising in societies where political systems rather than political parties are judged in instrumental terms and order and economic advancement are highly valued. Second, with respect to weak democracies and competitive authoritarian regimes, the BRI gives them the means, opportunity and cover to resist external and internal pressure for more accountable government and greater transparency, the primary effect of which is to bolster regime security. Prior to the onset of the BRI, China was already implicated in directing aid and non-concessional loans primarily to other author authoritarian countries. Empirical analysis conducted by aid data showed that from 2000, the year 2000 to 2014, the top 10 recipients of Chinese development assistance, of the top 10 recipients, six were dictatorships and three were competitive authoritarian regimes. Where non-concessional loans were concerned, half the top of the top 10 recipients were autocracies, three were competitive authoritarian regimes, and only two were democracies. Since the BRI was adopted as China's prim primary outward facing framework from 2013 onward, these trends have accelerated. Indeed, the China International Development Cooperation Agency, the peak entity created in 2018 to coordinate the country's aid, has been charged with facilitating BRI projects as one of its explicit goals. Such foreign investment and aid is provided free from the usual IMF and World Bank loan and aid conditions, including demands for good governance, respect for human rights, market and liberal reforms, and, it is and is justified as being consistent with the strict adherence of non-interference in the internal affairs of other states. This stance, however, has the effect of insulating elites from external democratizing pressures. Cambodia is an obvious example of China's use of development aid and BRI funding to prop up authoritarian leaders accompanied by a steep decline in democratic processes. There, the ruling Cambodian People's Party has steadily eroded multi-party liberal democracy whilst rece receiving China's steadfast diplomatic support and substantial levels of aid and FDI. China has been Cambodia's largest source of FDI in recent years and been between 2010 and 2016 gave 9 billion in aid or equivalent to around 40% of the country's GDP. Preceding the 2018 election, the country's main opposition party was banned by the Supreme Court, while its leader was imprisoned for treason, with both events endorsed by the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi as an effort to, I quote, protect political stability and achieve economic development. Further, the BRI is designed to operate op opaquely, and this complements and entrenches existing authoritarian practices that avoid transparent govern government decision-making. In contrast to multilateral development banks like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the World Bank, the BRI has no formal institutional structures and no set lending rules. Contract terms for BRI projects and MOUs signed by states that formally join the BRI are rarely made public. Most projects are not subject to competitive tendering with new projects and successful tenderers simply announced. Authoritarian governments tend to work better 
with other like-minded regime, like regimes. They are more in tune with the other's overriding need for regime survival and that, and that the means by which they retain power involves enriching their patronage networks. The opacity of the BRI has proved to be a useful means for smaller authoritarian regimes and weak formal democracies to access external resources to distribute gains to their supporters and otherwise bolster their domestic rule. As such, they have no incentive to insist on competitive tendering or transparency in contract terms. In weak democracies, BRI infrastructure deals have been used by incumbents to counter falling electoral support among their major constituents to demonstrate their economic development credentials and provide sugar hit to the economy. Chinese SOEs have been willing to assist in this regime survival project by inflating BRI provides opportunity for exerting political leverage for Beijing's, Beijing's own geostrategic ends. As the stronger player in a bilateral negotiation conducted without public scrutiny, it is able to insist on the delivery of projects by Chinese companies using Chinese workers and its own standards and disputes while asking for political concessions. These propositions are brought out in the recent case of Malaysia. There, it was the faltering of the, the country's economic performance that ate away at the electoral appeal of the ruling Barisan National Government up toward an even deeper embrace of Chinese investment under the BRI. As the one MDB scandal unfolded, Najib then looked to the BRI as a potential lifeline. In the course of Najib's ongoing corruption trials, evidence has been uncovered of Chinese officials' complicity in the financing of infrastructure deals at above market value, with the excess being used by Najib to bail out the excessive debts of political networks. This includes the, the US $16 billion deal to build the East Coast Rail Link, which the new Malaysian government estimated should have cost around $7.25 billion to build. Third, the export of China's surveillance state and pernicious illustration of the digital Silk Road arm of the BRI and its effect of undermining democracy and democratic practices. The model and tools for repression that have been developed and are being perfected in China, including the development of an algorithmic surveillance system to construct a citizenship score for each citizen by 2020 to incentivize good behavior, draws on online data as well as a growing network of surveillance cameras using facial recognition technology. Such technology is now also being used to repress the Uyghur minority in Xinjiang. Huawei is, the leading, is leading the export of this kind of technology and command systems under what it markets as safe cities, ostensibly as a tool of law enforcement, but with the obvious uses for authoritarian regimes. It is telling that the early purchases of Huawei's safe cities products and services were authoritarian regimes, including Russia, Pakistan, Venezuela, Laos, Angola, and Ethiopia. China's authoritarian ch challenge is a formidable one because there is a vast and receptive audience to its messages, values, and material offerings. The BRI might have begun as a relatively modest plan to further develop China's westernmost regions. But through the expansion of the BRI footprint, Beijing is challenging the decades old assumption that political freedom leads to superior economic and social outcomes. The US and other partners need not counter all aspects of the BRI, but at a time when democracy appears to be backsliding or in decline in many countries, they do need to counter those specific messages, 
values and offerings that are being used to undermine political and individual freedom. Democracy promotion through overarching programs such as the Indo-Pacific Transparency Initiative is a key but underappreciated strategy to counter not only the geostrategic but also the normative challenge of the BRI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Next, we'll go to Dr. Wang for his comments. Thank you very much for inviting me to join this uh, great conference. Uh, this today, not just only my my study, just on not only applied to the KMT, but also the applied to the DPP. Yeah, in fact, I did not too much the DPT, but I think the something or the same the condition uh, can apply to the DPP. Yeah, in this paper, I, think, I want to talk to Taiwan, the local criticism and the corruption, and uh, and uh, in way Tai. Uh, in my Taiwan experience, Taiwan is the uh, ranking one of the best performers in the Asia Pacific region. According to the uh, 2019 Corruption Perception Index CPI issued by the Transparency International, I think Taiwan is ranking very, very high in the ranking the and uh, 20s and uh, the score is the uh, 68. I think Taiwan is much better than the Korean and the South Korea, Korea, and uh, just little p less than the Japan. So Taiwan the is Taiwan performance is very very good. However, in the same time, we can see that this year we can this very famous the uh, uh, bribery scandal and uh, just call a so called uh, so case. He involved many, many lawmakers in the, from the different party. Almost in Taiwan, any political, major political party in, yeah, involved in this case. Like KMT, we seen the, the lawmaker Chen, Chen Zhaomin and uh, Chen Dongmin. And the DPP working to see the most very important, the Su Zhenqin. Even the Su Zhenqin just from my hometown district. And uh, also the independent maker Zhao, Zhao Zhenyu. And also the our old friend, the MPP, the chairman Xu Yongmin, he also involved us. Although the Xu Yongmin did not detained by the by the court, yeah. So my main argument is the in this the process, Taiwan judiciary had a make a pretty important though against the uh, against the criticism and the corruption. Yeah, even 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 Taiwan the judiciary far more the perform far more, far more the perfect. But I think Taiwan Taiwan the judiciary is, is much, much, much the independence. Yeah. So however, when I see the when we see the judiciary and make many yeah, much more progress in Taiwan, also they had a good performance against the Taiwan the corruption. However, there are many, the, many, many serious uh, limitations and the uh, judiciary against the criticism and the corruption. Yeah, I think that before we discuss that is uh, how the judiciary ignore against uh, this kind of corruption, I think uh, we, we have to remember, in fact, uh, every Taiwan the democracy and the uh, Taiwan the judiciary form Independent reform did not begin in when the Taiwan criteria and the corruption become very increased in was the in the beginning of the democracy. In when the in the survey the after the democracy, I think the uh, more than forty percent the the survey and responded consider Taiwan local government officially are corrupt and the low level level. Low level officially are perceived as more corrupt compared to the central government official. Because of Taiwan, in then you know most uh, local uh, election just hold under the under on the local on the national 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 level. However, I seen the uh, KMT then the KMT internal conflict like uh, the you know the the main. When, when, when the question uh, to Liu Pai and the uh, and now question now the main the conflict the, the 
the, the, the counter between the lane and the open is the political position like uh, judicial and uh, uh, the and the position. This is the open the uh, open the sea, open the two competitive different companies. So the Li Denghui, I think it's very important. Li Denghui just broke the local vision into the national party. So right now the, in, in the past, the, the local elite only can explore the resource on the lo uh, local government level. However, uh, in, in this time, the, the, this the kind of leader can, uh, can uh, explore and uh, use the national the resource and uh, uh, avoid the national policy. Yeah. So I seen that uh, before we discuss, I will see, I will, I will see something that, uh, you know, protable functional or uh, judicial for the I think one is very important is the purported bottle buying during the relation. I think the bottle buying is very uh, is, uh, uh, fundamental the part of the KMT, the uh, criterion campaign machine. Without the bottle buying the KMT criterion political machine, we will not be the able to function properly and uh, very, very well. So other the political is what the KMT client is too proud of to protect the cartelism elite corruption. And because in the past, the, the, the KMT elite just can, can to uh, use the corruption resource, however, no one to charge them. So, so I think the judiciary can protect them. So the KMT, the cartelism elite don't need to worry about, uh, don't need to about uh, uh, to be charged. Yeah, I think uh, we want to go to very detail. I think uh, Taiwan in the past maybe 30 years, Taiwan the judiciary have uh, made much progress. Uh, I want to go to detail. I think the first one in the court system, we call a case assignment reform. In the past, the, the prior judicial reform, this uh, case just uh, you know, decide by the, the chairperson of this court. And the chairperson was assigned by the judiciary. And uh, the chairperson, uh, the, the court uh, can assign a very important uh, case, particularly the corruption case to the judge, the chairperson can trust. So, so this, this, this can, you know, the protect uh, the came to the criteria uh, to be charged. A second one is a personal constituent uh, council reform. The person review the council as in the judicial is control the judge, the promotion and punishment and principle. If someone, uh, some judge can challenge the KMT, the, the policy or the KMT the partition, they may be transferred to the Rule hopefully uh, a far away the discord like the Hualien and the Pindong and the Penhu. Yeah. Another reform in uh, just the, in the particular system. I think that before they start to the institutional reform, I think they are very, um, uh, they are emerging in a new generation uh, the prosecutor. In fact, this paper very famous in the 1992 Hualien edition case. I think that the first one, Successful investigation of voting and voting flow in Taiwan. In fact, this uh, uh, we call the Hualien Zhou Piaihan because this uh, came, uh, DPP the DPP the candidate is the chairperson of the DPP then Huang Xinjie, and uh, they are only two. They are only two. The uh, very very young. They are less than the thirty years old. Uh, Hong Zhenhe and uh, Lai Qingxiang, and uh, two of both men. You know they are they are in charge of this case. And uh, finally, they, they charged the KMT, the DBP, uh, KMT, the candidate. And uh, also they, they put uh, the, the DPP to, to take the C uh, legislature union. And the second one we seen uh, in 1998, the, I seen the prosecutor, this first time Taiwan prosecutor, they, they carry on the collective action. They want to, you know, they want to, they just want to want, don't want don't want, don't want to be the anyone political tool uh, hold a rubber stamp uh, the intelligence intelligence. They claim that if they are the popular resource, they can carry on the mud, just 
corruption in Taiwan. So in fact, in summer, I seen uh, both the core and the particular reform, and you know, we can uh, control uh, any party, not just the uh, party control, not just the uh, KMT, but also DPP. In fact, uh, in the past 10 years, I don't see the uh, KMT and the DPP want to try to control the control the core and the and the and the and the and the prosecutor. Yeah. I think uh, there, are, well, there are several political and uh, consequences of the judicial reform and the uh, criticism and the corruption. I think the first one is the depression of criticism to elite. In fact, the KMT, KM, the KMT can, you know, if someone, the criticism elite, want to depress from KMT, the KMT just can use the legal way to punish him. This, uh, this uh, KMT elite. So KMT the elite don't not, don't not, the system cannot maintain the same. Uh, I think the, the second one, I think the, they, they, this, uh, you know, they, uh, excuse me. I think the next one, they are, you know, the KMT the system cannot continue to the continue the system. I think the many, many local questions did not have, cannot find very, very good uh, candidate to run the, can, to run the, the campaign. So we can see many, many local corporations they did not, they did not connect, cannot maintain their local organization, although they, don't, they cannot they know, maintain the, their leadership. The this one, I think the, they are lost the judicial protection in the election. Because the KMT, the KMT run the campaign, you know, they almost, almost not everyone, but almost they use the water buying. However, right now the the police and the particular prosecutor, they wrong. They every time they against this uh, this kind of water buying. They charge many many the the you know partition in this kind of in in this edition. So I seen this is a very very good example. Many people don't see Taiwan the judiciary have become the, you know, independent. However, in the 2000 legislation, you know, this is a very, very good example how the, how the, the prosecutor and the court to against this kind of corruption. In this time when, when 2008, you know, the Ma Injo just won the presidency for the, or almost uh, almost uh, the sixty percent more. In fact, the Ma and you know, they win the DPP candidate Xie Tangti more than two uh, two million two million more. Also, the KMT hold the the, the seat the the third post in the this in the seat. So so in case the the KMT, you can see the KMT control the dominator control X. Uh, excuse me, and the uh, Congress. Uh, however, you can see the in this year, the same year, you know, they are the for the voting case, you know, they are what charge the prosecutor and the, and the also you know uh, another by the the court. In way, this is this this uh, this uh, you came to can can still can many people can see the the KMT still uh, control the judiciary. You, so you, you can see the the political landscape, the KMT control the presidency and the Congress. The, the KMT can still easy to to control the judiciary. However, it's not. You can see the the for the KMT the member. You can see the Wu Tian, Jiang Lianhu, Liao Zhengjin, Li Shouwen, and the, another from the People First Party, Lin Zhengde. They are also from the same. You know, send the Pemplu, Pemplu case. So you can see the court can, they can challenge they against the, this kind of corruption, corruption and the cartelism. Yeah. However, I still argue the court not, not, not do the same good. You can see the, I like to see the Pindong case. I, you see the Pindong, the prosecutor officer is the most, the most reform minded one in the, in the the, the prosecutor system in, in Taiwan since the 1990s, in the in the Pindong case, they 
they can, they prosecute many, many, many uh, politicians in Pindong. However, you can see in uh, 2016 and the 2016, just one year, they are taking 20 special, more than 20, 20 the special edition. Why? Because several of his holder was indicted by the worldwide charge. So they lose uh, their office, their position, and uh, they need to, to they need to the uh, they need to a special special edition to to repair, replace. However, you can see the same the uh, even even the prosecutor charge so many many cases. However, political party not only the KMT or TPP. They, they tend to nominate their similar local elite to enter the special election. Like someone, the like DPP, the candidate was charged, uh, charged the voter buying case. However, they, uh, they send their daughter or their wife to go for the campaign. And yeah, and uh, another party, DP and KMT also send the same this kind. And, uh, the Pindong the prosecutor office also charged both of them. So this kind of pattern I've seen the state happen in the rural Taiwan, particularly in the Pindong. Yeah. So my conclusion is very simple. Yeah, judicial reform cannot make the law a new kind of candidate into the political 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 area. So they can they they cannot force the some the some the people uh, into the, this uh, campaign. Also, they can see they right now the the court and the prosecutor cannot make a new law to regulate the partition and the cooperation the relationship. So I think this is very, very important. I think the uh, if we, we only rely the uh, depend on the court to to challenge to against the clientelism and the corruption, I think there are very, very many serious uh, limit, limitations on this kind of strategy. So I, I guess, I, I, I guess, I, I guess I propose the new, I think the new, I think new, the, some the new phase or the new, the political party to join the election. I think this is, sim, this is similar Taiwan problem, very, very serious. Like uh, we have seen the 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 uh, uh, the political power party the the Sudai Liang the Sudai Liang don't not have many many candidates in the rural district. They have some the good candidates. They are in the national level like uh, Wang Guochang and the uh, uh, Chou Xianzi. However, in rural district, even in the Thailand Si, they are only one. Only one uh, the uh, city city council council woman. This is only one. So you want to change this kind of thing with new the uh, many many new ways into the join this kind of edition. Also, we we need new right now the nation the uh, Congress did not make many many law to you know to regulate the connection between the partition and the corruption. So you can see like a Yuan Dong case, Yuan Dong invent donated many, many money to the both party, major party. So the DPP, the candidate and the KMT candidate also received a, received a, don, a donation from the, this kind of big corruption. I think the new, this new, the new the challenge for Taiwan. Yeah, in fact, so I think the uh, I think that my point is very simple. The judicial reform is very is much more, much more, much many uh, progress in the Taiwan. So Taiwan the uh, judiciary judiciary is very very independent, and uh, it's very difficult for the political party to con control the control the, the judiciary. So you can see in this case the so-called case. Yeah, three major party, the KMT, DPPP, and uh, and uh, the the Sudai Liang. You can see three the major people, the member also involved in the case, and the three member you, you can see what charge was was charged. Yeah, so I think I think you Taiwan will want to go further to against the. Uh, 
corruption and the cartelism, we see new, new, uh, new uh, strategy. Yeah, this is my presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Uh, finally, we'll hear from the last panelist, uh, Karis Templeman. Uh, my brief today is to cover uh, Taiwan's resilience, uh, democratic resilience in the face of the PRC sharp power. Uh, and I think Taiwan is interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. First off, it's really on the, sh the front lines of uh, PRC sharp power projection. Uh, the CCP in China cares a lot about Taiwan. It's uh, used not just covert influence, but overt influence. In fact, the full arsenal, the, the gamut of, um, of uh, sharp power weapons that it can uh, to try to make Taiwan uh, more favorable to unification. Uh, and second, Taiwan, despite facing the full arsenal of CCP sharp power has been a really tough nut for the CCP to crack. It really hasn't gotten very far in trying to promote a pro-unification uh, identity or uh, opinion in Taiwan. Uh, and so uh, as a consequence, I wanna talk about today uh, why this is. Um, so uh, in particular, I wanna focus on this period over the last four years uh, where uh, Taiwan elected a new more China skeptical president and ruling party. Uh, in 2016, Tsai Ing-wen uh, was elected uh, president of Taiwan and her uh, democratic progressive party won a, a big victory in the legislative race and uh, won a majority for the first time. Uh, she did not in her inauguration speech uh, endorse a one China principle that Beijing accepted and therefore Beijing responded uh, to her inauguration speech by rolling out a very careful uh, graduated uh, increase in sharp power pressure on her administration in an effort to try to uh, erode her support uh, and force Taiwanese voters to elect someone more friendly to unification. Uh, her polling numbers ended up low for much of her first term, and this uh, approach by Beijing appeared to be working. In particular, in uh, late 2018, in local elections, the KMT, the more China-friendly party of the two major parties in Taiwan, came roaring back uh, and won a significant number of local races, uh, led by uh, a, a formerly obscure populist China friendly candidate, Han Guoyu, who won a stunning victory in Kaohsiung in Southern Taiwan, in an area that had traditionally been uh, a, a deep green DPP heartland. Um, so it looked like the DPP might actually struggle in the face of this concerted effort by the CCP to uh, undermine support for independence and promote support for unification. Uh, and then over the last uh, year and a half or so, the pendulum has swung back towards the DPP in a very big way. Uh, so in January 2020, uh, both Lanny and I were in Taiwan to witness uh, Tsai Ing-wen won big again. In fact, she won a larger share of the vote with a much larger, uh, much higher turnout uh, than she did in 2016. And so the CCP's sharp power campaign ultimately failed to achieve its primary objectives. The DPP is still in power. Uh, they're still, they still have not endorsed Beijing's preferred expression of the one China principle. Uh, and they look to be the, uh, to growing, to be growing in uh, strength and support in the electorate rather than shrinking. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the elements of Beijing's pressure campaign. Beijing has for a long time pursued a kind of dual track sharp power strategy in the case of Taiwan. So on the hard track, uh, when Tsai Ing-wen came into office, Beijing cut off the cross-strait hotline between the two governments. Uh, they ended all government to government official communication. They restarted the competition for diplomatic recognition. Uh, seven countries uh, since 2016 have switched recognition from Taipei to Beijing. Uh, they continued to squeeze Taiwan's international space. In particular, uh, 
Taiwan representatives in the World Health, Organiza World Health Assembly and the International Civil Aviation Organization were kicked out uh, at the request of Beijing. Uh, and uh, Beijing has also uh, been less hesitant to arrest and detain Taiwan nationals uh, for crimes that were committed outside the PRC. Um, so they've been prosecuted for crimes. So there's an effect, a kind of extraterritoriality that Beijing has pursued over Taiwan nationals that they did not before. Um, and uh, most noticeably, uh, particularly recently, uh, the number of PLA uh, air and sea exercises in Taiwan territorial air and sea um, have uh, increased significantly, including deliberate incursions across the midline of the Taiwan Strait. Um, so this is all part of the hard side of Beijing's pressure campaign against the Tsai administration. Um, the soft elements of Beijing's campaign have included selective engagement with non-DPP political elites, most notably the mayor of Taipei, Ko Wenzhe, uh, visited Shanghai uh, as a kind of sister city forum exchange. Uh, and because he had previously expressed that both sides of the strait were part of the same family, uh, that was language that was more acceptable to Beijing, and so he was allowed to visit Shanghai. Um, Beijing has also uh, rolled out economic measures to try to entice uh, skilled Taiwanese in particular to move to uh, the Chinese mainland and take up work there. Um, uh, most notably, most critically, uh, they've targeted uh, engineers in Taiwan's semiconductor manufacturing industry. Uh, and Beijing has also rolled out uh, expanded legal rights and benefits for Taiwanese living on the mainland. So uh, Taiwanese can get a residence card, they can then access social security benefits and uh, free schooling for their children if they live in a, a city that offers that. Uh, um, so most of these measures appeared from outside of Taiwan to be working. I've, I've argued that um, Taiwan's uh, that the Tsai administration's struggles in her first term actually had much more to do with domestic politics, I think, than cross-strait relations. But from Beijing's perspective, this pressure campaign seemed to be at least coinciding with a significant decline in Tsai Ing-wen's approval ratings. And so uh, two and a half years into her term, she was polling at under 30%. There was a pretty significant and sustained downturn in support for her. Uh, and so it's at a, her nadir that uh, the nine in one local elections are held and the KMT wins those uh, going away. Um, the KMT uh, wins 14 local races up from six. Hang Woyu, as I've mentioned, uh, is the headliner there, wins a shocking victory in Kaohsiung. Uh, he's supported by pro unification media in Taiwan uh, who have him on He's on the front page of the newspaper. He's on every television channel. He's dominating the coverage. Uh, and a lot of these pro-unification uh, media are uh, in some way, shape, or form linked to uh, the CCP influence campaign in Taiwan as well. And so Han Guoyu becomes a little bit uh, colored by uh, the support for him coming from what are pro-Beijing media in Taiwan. Um, after this election, though, it looks like Tsai Ing-wen might not actually win re-election. The KMT's prospects suddenly look strong again. Han Guoyu looks like he might be the presidential candidate. And overall, um, and as there are probably people in the audience who remember, there was a lot of fear at this time that the CCP uh, might actually be effectively undermining Taiwan democracy. Um, that of course, didn't happen over the last uh, year. Tsai Ing-wen's approval ratings shot back up. Um, Han Guoyu's uh, approval ratings fell. Um, and uh, over uh, about six months, they traded positions. Uh, tsai Ing-wen, by the end of the campaign period, looked like she was going to win going away. Uh, and she ended up, in the end, uh, coming in with a, a, an even larger share of the vote than she did in 2000. Uh, in 2016, and on much higher turnout, almost 10% higher turnout than in 2016. So this was a real triumph for Tsai Ing-wen and the DPP. 
and are a real setback for Beijing's attempt to, uh, to defeat them in this election. Uh, why did this happen? Well, I think there are some fundamental strengths of Taiwan's democracy that can, uh, that can tell us something about why this happened. First off, as, as Lanhe mentioned earlier, uh, Taiwan's electoral management system is uh, exemplary. I wish uh, the United States were closer to Taiwan's system. It is almost unhackable. It is very low tech. They use all paper ballots. Uh, their count is transparent. It takes place right after the election, uh, the election day closes. Um, uh, the results are counted up within a couple of hours, so it's very fast. Uh, and uh, the polling station is actually open for the count to anybody who wants to walk in and observe. So uh, even a foreigner like myself can walk in and just watch the count. It's very transparent. Uh, and that has the added benefit of undercutting rumor mongering about stealing votes or trends that seem to be different from what the national polls have predicted. If you know the partisan predilections of your polling district, your polling station and you watch the count yourself, you can get a pretty good idea of how the national count is trending. Uh, so the, the count that I watched uh, was in a pretty KMT friendly precinct in Taipei. Tsai Ing-wen uh, was neck and neck with Han Guoyu there. And so I could gather within just a few minutes that Tsai Ing-wen was gonna blow Han Guoyu out. This was a deep blue district and they're neck and neck. So in other places, Tsai Ing-wen was gonna have a much larger lead. And that increases confidence then in the election results that are reported. Uh, Taiwan has a very institutionalized party system. Uh, the KMT and the DPP have been around a really long time. Everybody knows their positions on cross-strait issues. And so the, um, the awareness of the threat posed by China to Taiwan or the opportunity posed by China to Taiwan is something that most voters already have. It's not an issue that the CCP can kind of fly in under the radar on. Uh, and in fact, it's the issue that the, the parties have been separated on really for 30 years. Um, so it's a very salient issue. Uh, and it means that pan-green voters especially are inherently suspicious of pro-China messaging. So if the CCP is targeting uh, DPP voters, uh, they're not gonna make much headway with a message that unification is great, you get all these benefits. Uh, there's a, an inherent suspicion of that message on the, the pan-green side, uh, which makes it a harder case to crack than uh, say in Australia or New Zealand where this is not relations with China are not a salient political issue for the most part. Um, finally, uh, right, so much of the CCP's success elsewhere has happened because it's covert. Most people don't know that influence operations are taking place. Uh, it's just not true in Taiwan. It's very clear uh, who is pro-unification, who is pro-independence, um, and it's hard for someone to advocate for pro-unification without being questioned about whether they're receiving support or money from uh, the, the mainland side of the strait. Uh, Taiwan does have some persistent democratic weaknesses, uh, most prominently the traditional media environment in Taiwan, like many places now is hyper competitive, it's unprofitable, there are generally poor ethics practiced in journalism, uh, and there are radio, TV, and newspapers uh, all susceptible to Chinese influence ops. So the, the most prominent example is the Zhongguo Shibao or the China Times, which um, it has since 2009 taken a very pro-Beijing stance in both its news reporting and its editorial line. So I have an example here of four cover sheets, the broadsheets of four daily newspapers in Taiwan in the summer of 2019. Uh, the three not circled are all covering Hong Kong protests. China Times is covering divisions within the DPP. They don't want to talk about the Hong Kong protests. Um, campaign finance in Taiwan is weakly regulated. Political parties uh, generally need to raise outside money in addition to public funding that they get. Uh, this has been a consistent problem for, for years in Taiwan. Um, there is, as uh, Jinshou 
mentioned uh, a long history of vote buying and uh, mobilization via local factions in Taiwan to win elections. Uh, th these networks have generally uh, deteriorated over time and uh, the prosecution uh, prosecutor's offices and the judiciary in Taiwan have actually been pretty effective at cracking down on vote buying. And so I don't view this as a, uh, the most uh, the glaring weakness in Taiwan's political system. It's actually fairly difficult to buy a local election now without getting caught and prosecuted for it. Um, and then finally, religious associations in Taiwan have been a significant target of United Front work for the CCP. Um, and they've been lightly regulated for a long time. Um, so in uh, 2020, how did Taiwan counter the CCP influence campaign? Well, uh, the media regulators uh, became much more proactive, more aggressive about punishing uh, bad media behavior, uh, unbalanced coverage, rumor mongering. Uh, the, the, uh, National Communications Commission actually fund, uh, fined uh, a Chinese, uh, uh, China television, so um, uh, pro-Beijing TV station for their coverage. Uh, the DPP controlled legislature uh, passed several amendments to strengthen legal protections against United Front work, uh, including an amendment to the Political Party Act. Uh, and as Jinsho has mentioned, uh, prosecutors' offices are pretty professional and pretty independent. They stepped up investigations and prosecuted uh, pro-Chinese voices who were clearly violating some of these new laws, uh, regulating uh, uh, working for agents based on the mainland. Um, I have some remaining concerns about Taiwan's democratic resilience in the face of uh, Chinese shark power. Uh, one is, uh, Taiwan's media industry, I think, is still uh, quite problematic. Uh, there may be a need for a more uh, robust public uh, television service or central news agency presence. I think campaign finance is an easy way to, or campaign finance reform is an easy way to strengthen Taiwan's democracy. Uh, providing more public funding for political parties uh, eliminates the need to go to private donors and certainly to money that may be ultimately sourced back to mainland China. Um, strengthening prosecutors' offices further, I think giving them the resources, uh, in including personnel and funds to go after uh, the rising threats to democratic institutions uh, would help. Um, and uh, there is surprisingly low trust among Taiwanese, uh, ordinary Taiwanese in the judiciary. And so there's a lot of talk about judicial reform these days, which Jin Shou is actually at the forefront of. And uh, so uh, if Taiwan is able to strengthen the uh, kind of rule of law culture, I think that would help in the face of Chinese sharp power operations as well. Um, so last slide here, I'll wrap up. Um, do we have comparative lessons from Taiwan that might apply to other democracies in the region and beyond that are facing a sharp power threat from China? Um, the first is, I think in Taiwan, it's very clear that they are under threat from the CCP and transparency about what CCP agents are doing in Taiwan is a good thing. Exposure really kind of uh, takes a lot of the uh, a lot of the power out of the uh, threats or the the operations that the CCP is engaging in. And so, a good example: uh, last summer, there was a uh, a foreign reporter who wrote a story uh, documenting that the Taiwan Affairs Office in Beijing was actually regularly dictating coverage in China Times, um, and. By documenting that and publishing it in a foreign outlet, uh, that really uh, kind of solidified what had often been rumored in Taiwanese politics. Uh, it actually, um, it undercut a lot of the China Times ability to, to influence the electorate. Um, second, uh, nonpartisan institutions and democracies are really important in pushing back. Um, prosecutors in Taiwan, intelligence bureaus and regulators all really did step up against this perceived threat, particularly after 2018, which was kind of a wake up call for all of, for the, the state institutions in Taiwan. Uh, private tech companies 
in, in Taiwan, Facebook and Line are the most prominent. They were actually much more proactive in 2020 in countering rumor mongering on their platforms. I think they could have done more, but they were certainly more effective than in 2018. Uh, and then finally, and most provocatively, I, I want to caution us against thinking that uh, Chinese sharp power and influence ops are really effective. Uh, what I've seen in Taiwan suggests that they're actually quite clumsy about what they're trying to do uh, and that they're handicapped either by bureaucratic incompetence or by ideology. And I'll leave you with one example from last year. The former DPP president, Annette Liu, attempted to run an independent campaign challenging Tsai Ing-wen, uh, so to run from her pro-independence left. Um, and rather than promote her candidacy, uh, the pro-unification media just mocked her or ignored her. If what you want to do is foster division within your main opponent, she's probably somebody you should have played up if you're uh, doing a Chinese influence operation. And so um, I'm a little bit skeptical that the CCP has actually optimized uh, their ability to to engage in some real disinformation or information warfare uh, that furthers their long-term goals in, in a place like Taiwan. And that suggests actually that uh, while we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, dismiss the threat, uh, we shouldn't make it out to be worse than it is in other democratic societies as well. This is a manageable problem, I think. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Karis. We will... Uh... Now move to our uh, discussant, Larry Diamond. Uh, let me begin by saying <clears throat> it proved to be a manageable problem in Taiwan. And it was manageable in Taiwan because Taiwan is made really far from perfect, as you understand uh, from listening to the papers on Taiwan, far from perfect, but nevertheless, really, I think, extraordinarily impressive progress in terms of corruption, rule of law, and improvements in the quality of liberal democracy. And I'd say if, if countries don't achieve greater strength and resilience in corruption, uh, rule of law, uh, and the quality of democracy and transparency, uh, it won't be a manageable problem in other societies. And I think that is a very important lesson uh, from this panel. Let me begin by just uh, giving you all some evidence that will uh, back up the point I'm trying to make. If you go to the World Bank's uh, governance indicators and just track uh, how Taiwan has changed since the first year that the World Bank's um, governance indicators started measuring rule of law, transparency, and other measures of the quality <clears throat> of governance in countries in 1996, which was coincidentally the year that Taiwan became a full democracy, you find that Taiwan's percentile score on the rule of law improved from 70 in 1996 to 82, 82nd percentile among all the countries of the world in 2004, slipped back a little bit to 79 after the corruption scandals at the end of Chen Shui-bian's presidency in 2009 and rose to 85 in 2019. And there was a very similar pattern in control of corruption. And I'll just say, Taiwan stood at the 73rd percentile in 1996 and stands at the 83rd percentile in 2019. It's not perfect, but today Taiwan, I'd say, is as robust and transparent and liberal a democracy as any in Asia. And I think the improvements in rule of law control of corruption and quality of democracy have had a lot to do with Taiwan's ability to repel PRC sharp power and penetration activities in recent years and in the 2000 uh, presidential election campaign. I fully agree with the remarks that uh, 
Karis Templeman uh, made on the additional steps Taiwan could take that would greatly improve its resilience. But let me now speak more generally about what we can learn from these two papers on Taiwan and from Lavina Lee's excellent paper on China's BRI efforts and its sharp power projection efforts around the world. And I would just uh, stress these seven lessons in terms of um, making countries better able to repel China's sharp power uh, influence activities. First of all, I'd say a transcendent lesson is the need for vigilance to build awareness and understanding in societies around the world that are the targets of PRC influence activities, which is most societies in the world. Um, we need vigilance in terms of the capacity to detect, to recognize and expose illegitimate PRC influence activities, efforts to pressure and sway opinion and policy by means that are, to quote, quote our watchwords from the um, um, recent uh, 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 Australian prime minister means that are covert, coercive, or, or corrupting. That is really the definition of sharp power. And this, in, this means in part promoting understanding, which we're going to seek to do in our project on China's global sharp power of the United Front as a phenomenon that seeks to burrow into the deep tissues of democracies around the world uh, and uh, use coercion and corruption uh, behind the scenes, out of public view, to try and win influence and co-opt agents of influence in the future. Second, the need for resilience. We need to do more to build institutional capacity and integrity in the way that Taiwan did for itself uh, in the last uh, 20 years uh, to better resist PRC, United Front and sharp power uh, activities. This means in part promoting uh, knowledge, but it also means developing the capacity for investigative journalism for researching and exposing relationships, linkages and activities that compromise democratic uh, integrity and transparency and that enable China uh, to project sharp power uh, and enable the United Front to do the classic work that it does. Here, I think there are enormous lessons that can be drawn partial though the progress was in developing judicial independence in what Taiwan did to fight what has been called black gold politics uh, and to make Taiwan therefore uh, a better rule of law state, more resilient uh, to repel uh, foreign influence activities in politics. Third, I think an inference that can be drawn from Lavina's paper is that we need to build uh, and offer support for societal efforts uh, at um, developing cross-national networks uh, to repel PRC influence activities. This is gonna require uh, collaboration among governments and civil societies to learn lessons and to develop common tools and information sharing for exposing and resisting PRC sharp power activities, for developing stronger, more independent media and civil society organizations, for rolling back as Taiwan was able to do, uh, entrenched systems of clientelism and corruption and developing uh, better capacities for intelligence and law enforcement, for, as I said, investigative journalism, and for sharing intelligence. 
it means uh, more radical systems of transparency and uh, counter corruption on an international level. I would say the open government partnership has a lot of process, uh, promise here in terms of making societies more resilient. We need stronger laws against uh, the projection of dirty money into politics and policy making. So our own Foreign Agent Registration Act, the new laws that Australia has adopted in this regard, stronger campaign finance laws, all of these have an important uh, lesson uh, to bear for societies in using transparency to make open societies more resilient against PRC influence activities. Uh, the sixth lesson is I think we need alternative flows of development assistance and in particular development assistance for the building and strengthening of infrastructure in developing countries. One reason why uh, the PRC has had something of an open field uh, in terms of BRI and its uh, use as a tool in projecting influence is that Western development agencies has gotten out of the business of building roads and other physical infrastructure. And I think we need to get back into the competitive game, either through the World Bank or through new uh, transnational flows of development assistance to aid countries in building infrastructure in ways that do not de depend on China's Belt and Road Initiative. The seventh uh, principle I would offer is conditionality, that US and peer democracies need to make clear uh, that uh, if countries throw in their lot in non-transparent ways with PRC uh, United Front activities, PRC United Front companies like Huawei, there will be consequences. And finally, we need to strengthen our own democracies. As Mike Brown, the head of the Defense Innovation Unit uh, said in a very important presentation, to our China Global Sharp Power uh, Conference on um, uh, China AI and human rights, we are in a superpower marathon with the People's Republic of China. We, the democracies of the world, I would now say Taiwan, Korea, Japan, the European Union democracies, and of course, Australia and the United States, we need to make clear that democracies can function transparency, transparently and effectively uh, to first of all, counter China's sharp power activities. And second of all, to work effectively, uh, to grow economically, to deliver a better deal to their own societies and to manage uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and if we don't, show that democracies can function effectively, dynamically uh, to deliver uh, economic growth and protect public health, it's gonna be hard in the long run to counter China's ambition to project global sharp power around the world. Larry, thank you for those fantastic uh, remarks and reflections on our um our papers today. What I would like to do is to give our panelists each a brief opportunity to respond or react to anything Larry uh, mentioned in his comments. And then we will be going, of course, to questions from the audience, of which we, we have many. So we'll try and fit in as many as we can first. So I'll turn it back to Dr. Lee to see if you have any reaction to uh, Larry's comments or to the comments from any other panelists today. Uh, thank you. Um, I Obviously, I think um, I agree with everything Larry has just said. Um, it was brilliantly put. Um, I, I think, uh, I suppose I would say that uh, one thing that I would add to my own remarks, um, drawing from what Larry said is that um, 
you know, the when we think of the BRI, I think mostly the emphasis is on things like debt trap diplomacy and the creation of client states um, through the use of infrastructure funding. Um, now, what, what I was trying to get, get at in my paper is that is obviously a very um, important problem um, and something that a, a lot of um, what Larry has just put forward, I think, gets at the heart of um, the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities of a lot of countries, particularly in the, in the Indo-Pacific, that are weak democracies with weak institutions. Um, but the broader point, I think, is that democracy promotion itself uh, beyond the geostrategic um, implications of the BRI is also fundamentally undermining uh, the broader narrative about the success and opportunity that liberal democracy can bring. Um, so I think all of your points um, that were made in the other papers about Taiwan and what Larry has drawn out about how Taiwan itself has improved and built upon its own um, defences against external sharp power, I think are great lessons for other countries. And perhaps that's, that's also our, our um, what we're drawing out of our conference is that um, our focus should also be in helping countries in the Indo-Pacific that are already existing democracies, albeit weak ones, um, where we have something to build on, where uh, we're not going to necessarily be accused of imposing values from the other outside, we're effectively assisting countries that profess to be democracies to be stronger and more res resilient democracies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wang, any uh, reactions? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that, uh, Professor Diamond, yeah, your point, I, I, all, all your point, I agree. Yeah, I just a uh, little bit respond to the, the audience the question, the question. In fact, in Taipei, they are uh, Miao Bo Ya and Jiang Wan, they are new face and they are new, uh, new, campaign, new campaign strategy, so they can win the election. However, in the uh, new Taipei, new Taipei, Xinta, Xinbei Si, Taoyuan, Taizong, the new power party, the Sudali Liang, did not win any seat. And in Thailand, they only one seat, only win one seat. The councilwoman, Lin Yin, she is the, she the performance is very, very great, very excellent. He challenged, she challenged many, many policy from the Thailand city government. However, they did not change, they, they, she cannot change any policy because they just only one person. One person, this kind of person in this council, and uh, in the uh, very world in Taiwan, in fact, uh, the Xi Jinping and the uh, Shi Jinping did not did not nominate any candidate. So I think we need to uh, uh, encourage some the uh, some the uh, new candidate into the party. And the second question about uh, the, the, the discharge of the judiciary. I think the Taiwan judiciary is not perfect. Even though they march with the judicial in, in, in independence, march much progress the, in, in this kind of perspective. However, Taiwan people have more higher expect, expect, uh, expectation from the judiciary. Also, so so now the judiciary have to have to do more, and also in where the Taiwan the media is very bad. I I, I don't understand it bad, and everyone can understand. So when the, some the decision from the court, the court did not expand the, the decision very careful. So the media just the, you know report selective and uh, sometimes wrong wrong, you know, the poor decision wrong. So the pe the people cannot receive very correct uh, the information. And I think it's a good thing the uh, in where the judicial and does uh, you know they just the uh, people are the new the uh, you know information office. They just to want to expand every decision, important decision I think it takes some time to the the Taiwan, the people to learn the law, to understand, 
to understand you know what happened in this call i think it takes some time yeah but this is a good good start for the for the code for the judicial yuan yeah thank you uh dr templeman yeah uh, i'll keep this very short because i want to hear from the audience but um I'll just pick up on something that uh, Professor Diamond said, and that is the role of non-state actors in countering uh, PRC influence. Um, in Taiwan, the social media companies actually had, a, a, they were on the front lines of countering Chinese disinformation. And I should add, not just disinformation from China, but disinformation that was organic, that was circulating, uh, was circulate rumors raised and circulated by by Taiwanese themselves and uh, Facebook actually was quite aggressive about uh, clamping down on rumors and they partnered with a local NGO Taiwan Fact Check Center uh, to uh, to write uh, basically debunking stories of various um, of various uh false rumors online and so um there's an opportunity here i think to take that model potentially to other countries as well and there's a big onus i think on the the social media companies to develop a, a better code of conduct a kind of set of best practices in the same way that journalists over the 20th century sort of developed a professional code of honor and code of conduct uh to to govern good journalism we need a similar kind of policy that could be shared across democracies for how tech companies should handle uh, online, uh, the online moderation of political speech. Thank you very much. Uh, why don't we go to some questions from the audience since we do have a number of them. Uh, let me begin by uh, asking a question from Kennedy Kidd. This is to uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, Kennedy asks, at first, Russia responded with reticence toward China's BRI, worried that the move would undermine Moscow's influence and future plans. They have since changed their tune and are now one of the initiative's biggest investors. Why? What changed? Does the BRI conflict with Russia's goals? Okay, from the, from the outset, thanks for the question. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily a, uh, an expert on the BRI uh, in that particular region, my research focuses more on the Indo-Pacific. Um, but I would, um, my educated guess, uh, analysis of it would be that uh, Russia, I'm sure, is um, its access to infrastructure funding from Western sources has been severely curtailed. And um, I think out of some sense of economic necessity, um, it has had to look at the BRI uh, in terms of its investment in infrastructure. So we know that Russia is heavily dependent on exports of its resources, but also of arms. Uh, they're very major sources of income for Russia. So uh, I think out of some level of desperation, they, they're moving towards the BRI just to develop their own resources in their own country. Now, at the same time, I would think um, as well that the Eurasian Economic Union is uh, Russia's big grand blueprint to exert a sphere of influence in its own backyard and the BRI overshadows and uh, really uh, under, undermines that, that objective. So I would, I would think that Russia would support those infrastructure projects that are um, energy related that might be developing the infrastructure, um, energy infrastructure of Central Asian countries where oil and gas pipelines, et cetera, uh, are in fact passing through Russia and onto Europe because that in fact enhances Russia's national interests. It, and, and any project that actually bypasses Russia, I, I think Russia would not be um, supportive of it. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Glenn Tiffert for Dr. Wong. Uh, Glenn says, uh, Dr. Wong seems to tell a story of weakening internal party discipline within the KMT and cultural change among younger judicial personnel. The first is well documented, but what accounts for the rising independence of younger judges and prosecutors? In fact, the, the many, many, uh, before the demographic, there are many, many corrupt 
In fact, the most uh, most judge are, are corrupt. In fact, I have an interview. They told me uh, more than uh, eighty percent uh, male judge and prosecutor, you know, have, have been corrupt uh, except the bribery. However, you can see in the past case, only only for the people, the 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 prosecutor and judge have been charged, have been charged with corruption, very, very few. However, this kind of, the people, the, the judge, you know, they are reported widely by the, by the, by the media. So I seen the, 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 the young, the, the young and the prosecutor, they, they are, they are, they are much more professional. However, they are this, the, this experience, also, they had some problem. They had not, they did not respond to the, to the social demand very much. This is why this this why this the this this is why the right now the judiciary want to do. Also, I want to add the one point in the, this is very 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 you know problem in whether the trust the, the judiciary. Uh, during the authoritarian regime, the period uh, is very, very high. And every democracy, even the uh, Taiwan, uh, the democracy had uh, much, much progress uh, uh, in the dependence. However, the distrust is very, very low. So I think the most, the, there are big the gap between the reality and the, the people position. So the young people, I think, is very, very, isn't it very, very good? And uh, their personality, they, are, they did not very corrupt. However, I seen they did not have social, very, very strong the social appearance. Many, many the young judge and uh, prosecutor, they, they just graduate, graduate from the school and uh, they just uh, you know, intern, in, uh, take the exam, enter the institute uh, and uh, judge, Judge Academy, and then become the, the judge and prosecutor. So they are, they are very young. I think this is a big problem for the, for the Taiwan judiciary. Uh, we have a question. I'm, I'm going to address this to Karis Templet, uh, Templeton. Uh, Templeton, excuse me. Um, it's from Tom Finger, and he asks, do Taiwan people vote for Tsai because they support her policies or because the PRC wants her to lose? Or is sharp power so counterproductive that they would uh, vote for a candidate from any party opposed by the PRC? Um, so I, I would think of it like this. There's a trade-off. Um, so, so the opportunity, uh, the mainland is an opportunity and a threat to Taiwan. Uh, it's an economic opportunity if China's economy is growing, if uh, the PRC is willing to kind of back off and allow Taiwan some diplomatic space. Um, but it's also a threat because it wants to annex Taiwan, uh, it wants to take over its political system, to ban certain kinds of speech, um, and ultimately control the island uh, for its own ends. Uh, and so Taiwanese people have to make a choice about which of those is more pressing. Um, and in the run-up to 2020, I would argue, and in fact, in the run-up to 2016 as well, the security and sovereignty concerns, in other words, viewing the mainland more as a threat than an opportunity, dominated the economic concerns. Um, and uh, Beijing unwittingly, I think, played a role in raising the salience of sovereignty and security issues. Uh, Xi Jinping, for instance, gave a speech on January 2nd, 2019, that was very poorly received in Taiwan. And you immediately saw Tsai Ing-wen's numbers spike. And so because she's the leader of the China skeptical party, she's going to benefit if there's, uh, if you kind of make more salient the threat that's coming from the PRC. The other obvious thing is the rise of the Hong Kong protests uh, in uh, starting in June of 2019. That just dominated coverage uh, in Taiwan. The uh, Hong Kong one country, two systems model uh, is what Beijing is offering for Taiwan. And as a consequence, uh, it is 
the only thing, um, the erosion of one country, two systems in uh, Taiwan or in Hong Kong is actually problematic uh, for any promises that Beijing is making to Taiwan. It just completely undercuts their credibility. And so um, the, the combination of Xi Jinping's speech, the, the Hong Kong protests, and then the broader sense that Beijing was taking the uh, directly elected leader of the Taiwanese electorate and basically saying, we don't care that you were directly elected. We don't care that you won this election. You know, if you don't bend to our will, we're going to squeeze you. And so there's, again, that, that insistence that you bend to our will or, we'll, or else we'll put a lot of pressure on you, just um, it raises the threat part of that threat versus opportunity. It raises the salience of that. And so I think uh, ultimately, Beijing's the, the more that they pursue the hard part of the soft hard trade off that the dual track strategy there is, uh, the more they undercut their own long term objectives in Taiwan. Thank you. So uh, why don't we conclude with one last question, and uh, this is directed to Dr. Lee, but really, if any of you would like to, to follow on, please feel free, but Dr. Lee first. Uh, what role do you think Taiwan can play in countering the threats that the BRI and I suppose other sharp power initiatives pose to the international community? Okay, um, I think um, Taiwan has an important role through its um, new southbound. Um, now, the southbound policy is um, a means by which it provides to the Pacific, to, to South and Southeast Asia. And I think along with, I think what Larry was talking about, I, I completely agree that there is a lot of scope for Taiwan to join along with other democracies in our region um, to support uh, democratic practices and institutions and accountability mechanisms within Southeast Asia. Now, primarily, you know, Taiwan can't compete just as Australia or India. Uh, we can't compete in terms of providing direct infrastructure investment, but what we can do is support uh, technical assistance, um, the capacity of governments to actually be able to assess whether a particular project that's put forward and advanced by China is actually feasible or has any economic benefit or uh, professes labor and environmental standards that are actually going to be achieved. Um, a lot of these small countries just don't have the technical um, skills and capacities to, to assess properly. And then they find themselves in a in a potential debt trap type situation. So we don't want to be, uh, we, we want to assist countries and I think other democracies should band together with Taiwan and uh, be part of this southbound policy or Taiwan be set part of the Indo-Pacific strategy in that sense. Um, and I think as part of this southbound policy, they're already um, supporting NGOs, civil society, um, the kinds of things we've been talking about, the development of the rule of law and the free press. Um, you know, if, we, if we're talking about the importance of transparency, transparency shines a light on corruption. So we want to actually assist um, these societies to develop the ability to shine a light on corruption when they, when they see it. Um, and I think uh, there's also scope through the Digital Silk Road. Again, it's education um, to help countries understand what the potential benign, so malign impacts of adopting uh, parts of the digital Silk Road are, and the importance of protecting privacy, uh, limiting the use of surveillance and artificial intelligence for facial recognition technology. Um, all of those things, a lot of countries, I've, I've even read of countries in Europe um, that have bought into these, these systems unwittingly, not knowing where the data is going and what it's being used for and how it can be misused. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of scope there for um, capacity building assistance to understand the pernicious aspects of the BRI. Um, and uh, I think Taiwan can be part of that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else on, on that issue before we wrap up uh, this afternoon and evening and morning for some? Well, thank you to the panelists, to uh, Dr. Diamond, Professor Diamond, for his comments as well. And with that, Glenn Tiffert, back to you. Thank you very much, Lanny. And I'd like to thank uh, Larry and our three panelists for a phenomenal session and discussion. We hope that you'll be able to attend the concluding session of this conference on Thursday, or if you're in Asia and Oceania, on Friday at the same time. 
That one is entitled China's Rise and Prospects for Security and Stability in the Indo-Pacific Region. It includes a stellar cast of experts and former National Security Advisor to the President of the United States, H.R. McMaster, now a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, will open the event with a keynote speech. We hope that you'll join us. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.